thing as I was at lunch waiting to receive my lunch, this young man walks up to me and he says, um, take a look at this. I'll need it back, but let me know if there's anything that you're interested in. And it was a catalog that had t-shirts and jerseys and hoodies and they had you know, all kind of Christian sayings and logos and all that. So I was like, okay. So I started thumbing through the pages and then there was this t-shirt and it said, blood bought. And the words came off the page. It had Ephesians 1, 7, and then it had the scripture written out at the bottom. That word just resonated with me. And I was like, you know, I have got to get this shirt. So I went ahead and I purchased the shirt. And ever since then, you know, it just, I just had to think about that word. Blood ball, as we know, means redemption. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ redeemed us from sin and its penalty. Right? And that's so general. He did it for us all. But that, that word, blood ball, that made it personal for me. I recall the story of, and I think it's found in the, sorry, in the book of Matthew, where this man um, came across this piece of land, and he found treasure on that land. So what he did was he hid it. He hid the treasure, but he went he sold all that he had, excuse me, and then he bought that land, because that land, it was precious to him. Well, that's what Christ did for me. He looked at me. He saw value in me. He saw that I was precious, and he deemed me worth dying for. Amen. Redemption. So, I want you to think about that word, blood ball, because you're blood ball. You're blood ball. We're all blood ball. We weren't paid for with money. It cost him his life. So. I want you to reflect on that word and think about what it means to you. Not to me, but what it means to you. What he did for you. How he sees you. You are precious in his sight. Amen? Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you Father, for his blood. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made. We thank you, Father, for this time of fellowship together. Father, we will be careful to give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise that is due you. For you and you alone are worthy. Father, we thank you for our pastor this morning. We thank you, Father, for the word that you've already prepared for us. I ask you to use him mightily. So I thank you. I honor you. I bless you. And I praise you. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on. What a way to start out. What a word. Amen. What a reflection. Blood ball. We are the redeemed of the Lord. Amen. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.
Well, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting, everlasting life. Hallelujah. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. How do we know? Because the Bible, the Bible tells us so. Amen. So we say this song to him this morning, telling the Lord that we love him. I just really want to tell you that I love you, Lord. Thank you for your love towards me. Thank you for your love towards us. Hallelujah. Our lives are in your hands, Lord. Our lives are in your hands.
that our lives are in his hands. I know he's got the whole world in his hands, but it just gives me comfort to know that my life is in his hands, that every step is ordered by him. Hallelujah. What a loving God we have. What a loving Savior we have, that he would lavish his love on us. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you for your love, Lord. We thank you for your love, Lord. We thank you for your love, Lord. There is none like it. Hallelujah. No love that can compare to your love, Lord. Hallelujah. And we declare this morning our love for you.
chapter 1 Kings, I'm going to read verses 1 through 17. I will be reading the King James Version. This is my third teaching on this, position for God's hill, position for God's hill. Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and have commanded the ravens to feed thee. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went unto went, went and dwelt by the brook Carrot. That is before Jordan, and the ravens brought him food and bread and flesh, and in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook, and it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had not been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. He called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal, and a barrel, and a little oil, and a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and for my son, that we may eat and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make it for thee, and for thy son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the crude of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. 
that she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. Oh, yes. And she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of oil wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fulfill according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. So, Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you, Lord God, for your presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us. Thank you, Lord God, that you're mindful of us, that you visit us. We thank you for your love that never fails us from generation to generation. We thank you, Lord, that as I teach this word this morning, hide me behind the cross, not about me, but all about you. Let no flesh glory in your presence. There's a spirit that quickens the flesh, popped of nothing, and the words that I speak, there's a spirit in your life. In Jesus' name, let church say amen. amen. You may be seated. As I've already said, this is the third teaching on position for God's healing. Position for God's healing. In 1 Kings, we just saw that there's uh, the introduction of a man by the name of Ahab, and Ahab was a king. And Ahab did evil in the sight of God. He led the Israelites in worship of Baal, a heathen god who they believed brought the rains. Ahab did more evil in the sight of God than any other king before him. You imagine that? Before, before any other king before him, he did more evil than any other, any other king. He married a woman by the name of Jezebel, and he began to bow down uh, in the worship of Baal. Uh, he built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. Then he set up what was known as an Asher pole in honor of the fertility goddess. I want to tell you something. Never remain in the company of food. Don't find yourself in the company of food. Don't find yourself in a relationship with somebody who doesn't believe what you believe. Amen? I want you to know that you'll meet a man, you'll meet a woman, and they'll say to you, uh, you, you know, you, you're looking to get married or be in a relationship, and, and, and the person says, uh, you know, I go to church sometime, and I, I believe in God, but, but they're not where you are. And the God they believe in is not the same God you believe in. You don't want to be in a relationship with a person like that. Amen? If they're not saying, believe in the same God you believe in, you don't want to enter into a relationship like that. Amen? The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 chapel, chapter, verse 33, it says, evil communication corrupt good manners. And 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 says, if a man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him. In other words, what he's saying is stay away from that person. You don't want to be in the company of food because food says what? Food says that they don't believe in God. That's right. So you want to stay away from people like that. They're not moving in the same direction that you're moving in. Stay away from them. I know sometimes it's hard because we become friends with people and they seem to be good people. But if they're not moving in the same direction we're moving in, you don't want to be a part of that. Because many times we think we can influence them, but they end up influencing us. That's right. So a lot of people in our society who believe in other gods and refuse to worship the true and the living God. Amen? I want to tell you something. One person can lead a whole nation into wickedness. And that's what Ahab did. He led a whole nation into wickedness. That person's evil can destroy the entire nation and, and governments because of the corruption of people have fallen. The Bible says this, that when the righteous are in charge, the city rejoices. Amen? And Numbers 33, 12 says, Bless this nation whose God is the Lord. So we only worship one God, not other gods. We worship one God, and we don't bow down to any other God. So Ahab had a strong military defense, but when it came to the reins, he had no control over the reins, nor could his evil priest uh, bring rain. So Elijah does something. Elijah bravely confronts the king who had led his people into evil. He said to them, he said to him, he said, there won't be rain for a few years, until I give my word again. This is God's way of punishing the Israelites for the evil they were involved in. I asked the question today. I'm not saying it's true. I don't know because I, I, I can't judge. But what we're going through as a nation, 
I wonder if God is punishing us. I wonder if the plague that came, COVID, I wonder if it's a way of God trying to get our attention. I wonder if everything that we see going on in the world today is it God's way of trying to say, y'all better stop and, and think about what's going on. They'll be praying, better live according to the way I have commanded you to live. I wonder. We're bowing down and we're worshiping idol gods and getting into all kind of evil stuff. But we have to understand, God won't always wink at evil. He's not going to always wink at, at the wickedness. Amen? Amen. And so he, he, he tells Elijah, after Elijah gives his word to, to Ahab, he puts him in protective custody. He says, Elijah, I want you to go to the brook of Karen. And he says, now when you go there, he says, I have commanded the ravens, the unclean birds, the ones that only feed their own family, I have commanded them to feed you. It's amazing how God can communicate. We say, how can people, how can God communicate to the animal? Because he controls the animal. It's no different than us commanding a dog or commanding some other animal. God is God. Amen? Amen. And so how are we questioning how did God do that when, when we can speak to lions and tigers and bears, tigers and bears, tell them what to do. It's no different. Amen? So he commanded them to bring bread and meat each morning and evening to drink from the brook. And, and God took care of Elijah through extraordinary and spectacular means. So these were specific birds that were assigned. I want to tell you something that how God works. Because we, we want to box them in. But what God would do is God would do spectacular, extraordinary things. Spectacular, extraordinary things. Amen? I want to tell you, when we started this church, you know, I didn't know how we were going to be provided for I didn't have an idea, but God provided. God used people that I never thought he would use. Some people I didn't even know. God used them. God brought people. God, God did that. Everything and everyone is subject to him. And we don't have to try to figure anything out. Now, since it stopped raining, guess what? Eventually, the brook dried up. And so when the brook dried, dried up, Elijah probably started wondering, what am I going to do now? Right. But you know what? God never told Elijah that the brook's going to dry up because Elijah would probably start thinking, well, what am I going to do? What's going to be the next step for me? So God doesn't always tell us everything in the beginning. He tells us things as we need to know. You know why? Because we'll get filled with anxiety. We'll start to ask questions and, and wonder uh, about God. And we'll be thinking about tomorrow when God tells us, take no thought for tomorrow. God already has a plan for you and me. He had a plan for Elijah, and this was the next plan in Elijah's life. Like God has the next plan ready for us in, in our life. Amen. I often ask God myself, what's your next plan for my life? What's my, your next plan for my life, Lord? And even though he orders uh, Elijah to, to uh, order his steps, it doesn't mean that God won't reorder. <laughs> he'll order our steps, and then he'll reorder Yes. At the appropriate time. He'll lead us to a place. He says this is the place for us to be. Then he'll reorder the steps to take us someplace else. Because he sees the end from the beginning and ancient things from things that are yet to come. Sometimes that's why God would say to people, I want you to relocate to another city. He says, I want you to relocate there because there's a plan, there's a purpose that you must fulfill. There's destiny that you must fulfill. And it's not in this place. That's why I told Abraham, he said, get out of here and go to this place I'm going to direct you to. That's right. That's right. So God sent Elijah to live in this village of Zarephath. Mm -hmm. He could have had him go to a whole lot of other places, but he chose that place. And that was a reason for it. Amen? Sometimes things are not always made clear to us. We don't know why God is having us do the things that having us do. But it's always a part of a much larger picture. That's right. The picture that you and I can't see but it's a larger picture. Things that we can't comprehend our, ourselves. So he told him, he said, go there. He said, there's a widow woman that's going to feed you. Now think about it, it's a widow woman. You got to have strong faith to have a widow woman feed him. When widow woman, they were destitute most of the time. They need somebody to take care of them. God said, there's a widow woman that's going to sustain you. So if they had no family to support them, how in the world are they going to support uh, Elijah? But he went. Here's a, another supernatural way of providing for Elijah. You know, a lot of times what we do is we look at God 
and we expect him to help us in conventional ways, right? But he says this in Isaiah 5th, 6th chapter, 4th, 5th, 5th chapter, 5th verse. He says this. He says, my ways are not your ways. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. He said, my thoughts and my ways are higher. God says, you can't comprehend what I'm doing because I'm God. My ways and my thoughts are higher. Okay, you can't comprehend what, what I'm saying. Just, just flow with me. Just come along and just go with me. I'm, I'm taking you someplace. And where I'm taking you to is a land that flows with milk and honey. I'm taking you someplace. He says he will provide all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. If he takes care of the sparrow, he'll take care of you and me. He says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. Amen. So it's amazing because when Elijah gets to the city gate, when he gets there, this woman, this widow woman, is picking up sticks. How did Elijah know that that was the one? Because the Holy Spirit, it wasn't the Holy Spirit, but the Lord told him that was the one. But God would tell us, this is the person that's going to help us in our life. He'll give us a confirmation that, that somebody's going to help us. If he's directing us someplace, he's confirming through the Holy Spirit in us that this is the one. He sees this woman, and he knows that she's the one. She's picking up sticks. And he says, uh, he says uh, would you bring me a glass of water, please? And she goes. She didn't ask any questions. She started walking to get the water. She, she's going to get the water, man. She's going to get the water. He says, oh, by the way, as you're going, do this for me. Yes, yes. Fix me a morsel of bread. Yes, yes. Bring me, bring me just a little bit of bread back. Bit. And she turns to him and she says, wait a minute. Just a little bit. She said, I don't have no bread. Yeah. She was hopeless. Yeah. She, was, she had nothing. Yeah. Nobody was walking over to her as a widow woman trying to give her something, trying to help her out. They knew it was just her and her son. But nobody was offering her anything. She says, I'm gathering sticks because I got just a hand, handful of meal and I got just a little bit of oil. I'm going to get ready to fix some bread for me and my son. We're going to eat and die. She was hopeless. As far as she was concerned, it was the end of her life. And many times, that's what we feel. We feel like we look at things and we feel, we feel hopeless. We feel like there's nothing that can change in our lives. And when we ask to do something, that seems to threaten our finances or threaten our resources, we back up and say, wait a minute, this is all I got. I can't give you this. This is, this is all I have. And, and so we hesitate and we want to avoid losing, the, the risk of losing what we have. That's right. So he tells her, he says this, he said, uh, the Lord says, uh, the Lord says uh, 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 that he, that, that you will have enough until he sends rain upon the earth. And she's probably thinking like this, what you talking about? Elijah, what you talking about? The Lord says, yeah, and, and so what she can't understand is there's a bigger picture. She was saying, probably saying something like, you must be kidding me. You want my last? I got just a handful of meal. I got just a little oil, and you want to take my last? Don't you know this is a big ask for you to ask that of me? But if you had a little, and God said, I want you to do this with it, how would you respond? If you had just a little, wow. and God says, I want you to do this with it, wow. how would you respond? I remember I took a chance uh, at doing something. Uh, I, uh, somebody asked for something, um, and uh, I didn't want to do it because it was my last. Yeah. I'm going to find a person when it comes to my last. Yes. I want to tell you, I'm going to find a person when it comes to my last. As a matter of fact, when it comes to my last, I don't want nobody to touch my last. I don't care how special you are in my life. Don't touch my last. Yes. I used to tell my wife all the time, I said, look, you got a checkbook. I get allowance. You got access to everything I have. I, I, all I ask you to do is don't touch my last. Mm. I said, look, if I got, if I got uh, one cookie left, don't eat my last cookie. If I got one piece of candy left, don't eat my last piece of candy. If I got one apple, don't eat my last apple. I just, I, I'm serious. I'm saying, saying to her. I said, whatever you do, <laughs> don't take my last. I used to tell her that. And sometimes she, she said to me, she said, I know you said you don't want to take your last, but I want you to know I eat your last cookie. <laughs> and I said, I can't believe you did that. You really did. I asked you not to do that. You really did that. I'm be upset about 
I said, you could be passed by all these stores, you could have got all this, but you can't along, you ain't your cookies, but you eat my cookies, my last cookies. And I'm I didn't like it. I didn't like it. But this lady asked me, she, you know, they were taking up this office, this prophet was, was there, and uh, uh, I had I didn't have a whole lot of money. Uh, we we uh, uh, had a house, and a person who was living in the house wasn't paying, and so we were paying double mortgage payments. And uh, I don't know how, how you feel about that, but I couldn't, I couldn't afford to pay more, double mortgage payments. Yes, I couldn't do it, so I, had, I just had just a little. And asked for that, that, that my last. And I was standing there, I held up service for about an hour. Yes, <laughs> I wasn't budge. I cost somebody giving up my last. And then the Lord spoke to my heart and said, give it. And when I gave it, this is what the prophet said to me. She said this, she said, this is how I knew it was God speaking. She, she said, the Lord said, he saw you playing underneath the house. Well, nobody knew I played underneath the house except my siblings. They weren't at the church. They weren't in the back passing more information. She knew because God told her. As a matter of fact, when I was young and playing underneath the house, I got caught underneath the house. One of the, one of the, the rafters had a nail hanging down. As I was crawling underneath the house, it got caught in my back. So I was caught on all four for hours. Mm. They said my dad wore out a pair of shoes trying to find me. My mom cried her last tears trying to find me. The whole neighborhood was looking for me. And my mom came to the house in the house that duplex we live in. She stood there. She stopped right there. She said, my baby's right here. My baby's right here. I'm in this house. And my dad said, what you talking about? Yes. She said, my baby's right here. He's right here. Go look and see if he's underneath that. My dad ran looking at the crawl space. And there I was on all four. Underneath that house. I was five, six years old. Mm. And he said, Come here, come here. And I got ready to come, but I couldn't because the nail was in my back. And I was too scared to say anything. So he crawled underneath that house and got me. But the lady said to me, She said, The Lord see you, saw you playing underneath that house. So she said, I'm glad you gave that money. This is what she said to me. You'll never have a rainy day. She spoke those words in my life. She said, You'll never, as long as you live, have a rainy day. I praise God. Up until not this point, I've never had a rainy day. From that day to this day, I've never had a rainy day. I've always had more than enough. Wow. Abundance. Wow. Abundance so that I could even give some away. Oh, Sometimes we don't want to give our last, uh, but God says, if I want you to give my last, yeah. your last, which is not yours, uh, uh, you're just a steward over it anyway, okay. will you do what I ask you to do? Okay. Warn them that are risky to be not high man, but trust in the living God who gives risk all things to enjoy. First Timothy 6, 17. I'll never forget that scripture. He says, I want you to be my distribution channel. Will you be my distribution channel? I want to give you more yes. so that you can do more and for the kingdom of God. But we want to take it and put it all on ourselves. If I ask you to give your last, will you give your last? Uh, uh, not through trickery. Uh -huh. Not through anything like that. But because I say do it. So this woman is saying, you want me to, to give me my last? And yes. my, yes. I, 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 don't, I don't know if I can... I can I can do that. I'm trying to prepare a meal for me and my son. That's right. And so she probably felt like she was at her lowest level um, and that uh, her faith was distant and seemed almost impossible. Amen? Amen. Again, nobody wants to give their, their last. But he is a God that multiplies. Yes. Our God is a God that multiplies. And God mm -hmm. always multiplies and has he ever multiplied anything in your life? Has he ever taken a little and multiplied something in your life? In the King, second chapter, in the second Kings, the fourth chapter, verse one through seven, there's a story about a widow woman who had two sons, and she was about to lose them because she owed a debt. And the creditor was coming to take those two sons, and without those two sons, she was really going to be pretty, pretty bad off because they were the ones that supported her, that sustained her. So she went to Elijah and she said to Elijah, she said, you knew my husband. Yes. And this is what she said. She said, you knew my husband, thy servant, yes. did fear the Lord, yes. and a crust has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondsmen. Mm -hmm. So apparently this man had served Elijah because she said, thy servant. <clears throat> and so she was intimating that she needed something from Elijah, a favor from him, uh, because of the service that her husband had given to Elijah. Elijah said to him, he said, what do you want me to do for you? 
He said, what, what do you want me to do? He says, uh, what do you have in your house? She said, I don't have anything but a jar of oil. I said, I don't have a jar of oil. But what looks like nothing to us is more than enough for God, if we're willing to let him multiply. Israel was not a nation of many people, but God told Abraham, he says, you shall become a father of many nations. He says that you have descendants so many that, you, just like the stars, you won't even be able to count them. Two fish and five loaves of bread fed 5,000. He's a God that multiplies. Amen? And so he turned a, 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 a small group of people into a, a nation of, of people. So he told her this. He said, do this. You, you just got a jar of oil. He said, I want you to go borrow as many empty jars as you can. Go borrow from your neighbor. Uh, he, said, he didn't say go ask for a handout. He said, go borrow some jars. You and your son, go borrow as many as you can, you can, you can, you can find. And, and when you get them, I'll come back and tell because I want you to go in and shut the door. And I want you to uh, do what I tell you to do. And so she went and got all these jars. She brought them into his room. They brought them into his room. She came to Elijah. She said, Elijah, I did as you told him. I got all the jars that you asked me to get. He said, no, I hear the problem to you. Shut the door. He said, pour out until they're full. Shut the door. You and your two sons. And pour out until they're filled. I want to tell you. Remember what I just said. Shut the door. And pour out the oil until it's filled. I want you to remember what I just said. When I go get my physical now, I'm at the age that when I get my physical, as uh, they do cognitive tests. So one of the things they do now is they say, I'm going to say something to you. And 15 minutes later, I'm going to come back and ask you to repeat what I said. Most of the time, this is what they say. Somebody's name, somebody's address. And, but they, they, they trick you or they cause you to lose concentration and focus because they start talking about something else. So 15 minutes later, when they come back to you, you know, you got, you, if your mind is the right, it'll show up. So they always do that. Most of the time, I mean, I, every time so far, I've got, I've got it right. Which is what this year holds. I believe God that it's, my mind is still, I still remember well, still got good memory. But I'm telling you this because I don't want you to remember what I just told you. Shut the door. I'm going to talk about something else for 15 minutes and see if you remember what I just told you. <laughs> he said, shut the door. He said, uh, he's not, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pour out until each vessel that you have until it's full. All the jars they brought in, they poured out and they finally got full. When they got through, she went to Elijah. She said, it's done. He said, well, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want to take the ones that you need, that you have. He said, I want you now to uh, pay off your credits. He said, the rest of them I want you to live off of. He's a God that multiplies. He's a God that will give you more than enough. Not only for you to live off of, but for you to help somebody else. For me to help somebody else. Amen? It was her, her simple demonstration of faith, uh, just like the woman in Zarephath, that made the miracle possible. Are we holding up God because we don't have simple faith and that we don't demonstrate our faith by doing what God has told us to do in both instances? They were obedient and they exercised faith. Are we holding up God, missing out on his blessings, because we are not demonstrating faith and we're not being obedient? Good word. Good word. My love. She was about to lose her son. Good word. But God intervened. Am I holding Amen? Am I holding so now we go back to Elijah mm. and the, the woman at Zarephath. Sometime later, the woman at Zarephath, her son died. Remember now, it was three and a half year period that it wouldn't rain. The Bible tells us at what time, what period the son died. The Bible just says sometime later, the son died. So when the son died, the woman immediately went to, uh, to Elijah. Um, uh, he got worse, he got worse, and he finally died. And I want you to understand something. That just because you witness a miracle, just because I witnessed something spectacular in my life, it doesn't exempt us from future trials in our life. Amen. Future trials. Amen. Amen. Psalm 34, 19 says this. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver us from them all. Amen. He will. Amen. From each and every one of them. Maybe not the way we want, but oh, he does deliver oh. us from them all. Oh, the way we want. Amen? Mm -hmm. He delivers us. Uh -huh. so, so remember when Elijah had this contest with the prophets, the 450 prophets? Mm -hmm. You know, here, this, this, this contest, and 
and uh, he, he won the contest. God is true God. And those 450 pro uh, prophets were killed. And when Jezebel heard about it, Jezebel sent word, tell Elijah the same thing he did to them. I'm going to kill him. So Elijah ran from his life, for his life. He went from a miracle, from being a hero and a miracle, to now running from his life, for his life. See, just because things wonderful happen in our lives doesn't mean that we're exempt from trials and tribulations. In this world, you still have tribulation, but the Lord will deliver us from them. Amen? We shall overcome them. So all sorts of things were going through this lady's mind when she, her son died. She was thinking, I've been kind to Elijah. God, why would you let somebody that happen? How many times have we say, I've been faithful. I tithe. I serve the church. I, I feed the homeless. I go out and witness on the street. and I see people in need. and I provide for them. God, how do you let something like this happen? Have you ever asked that question? I've asked that. I, I, I asked that question. How did this? I served God. I served you. Yeah. I served you with everything that's in me. That's right. I've given you everything that I have. Everything, everything I own, I say is yours, and I'm acting like it's yours. Why? Wow. Something bad happened in my life. Wow. Why? We ask that question. God don't get mad with us asking Him that question. I, 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 I really, you know what? I really ask the question, get before Him, and go to a liquor store. I rather, I rather get before him and ask him a question than go get a prostitute. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I rather ask him a question than go get on drugs. Yes, yes, yes. I rather ask him the question. Uh -huh. I would. Uh -huh. Because he ain't going to get mad with me. Right. What he's going to do, he may not speak to me. He may not say what I want to say in that moment, but, but God comforts me. So I always say, I, I lean in, I don't lean out, I lean in. I, my lean in means that I get before him, I spend more time with him. Yeah. I'm not the first, I'm not the last. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Whatever you're going through, you're not the first, you won't be the last. Everybody, Everybody. somebody's going to first. Everybody. And, and nobody's going to last so far because the world hasn't ended. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Amen. So all kind of things were going through this, this lady's mind. She said to him, she said, did, did, did you come here to point out my sin? Because one thing we start asking ourselves when things aren't going well, we start asking ourselves, did I open the door somewhere? Did one of my children open the door? Did my husband open the door? You talk, turn to each other, you, you, you in sin? Are you, are you in sin? Are you doing something you shouldn't be doing? We ask ourselves that question. No, God said, this is what they call L-I-F-E, life. And things happen in life. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, she's be turning 87 in, uh, in March. Mm -hmm. And she was telling me, she said, I lost my husband. You know, I lost my husband in 60 years. He died. I said, yeah, I know. I said, yeah, I know. She said, but what makes it even worse is seven months later, I lost my son. He died. Mm -hmm. She said, now, my husband dying was hard on me. She said, but my baby died. She said, oh, she said it was painful. I felt her pain. I, I, I felt her pain because mm -hmm. horrible things happened. In our lives. But if we're not anchored in the Lord, we can lose it. We can absolutely lose it. She had been kind to Elijah and she thought that she deserved better than now she's faithful to the tragedy of the of the worst kind because her only child is dead. Her only child is dead. I don't know how you felt, but the other day when when uh uh Hamas, uh, uh the militant Iran uh, group from Iran Set that drone in, got past our defense, and killed those three people in Jordan. Uh, I watched uh, the news on that several times. And uh, can you imagine, those of you in the military, you know how, or been in the military, you know how it is. You have to go to these families and say to them, knock on the door, and you say, your child died. From one house to the three house they went to. And one lady said this when they interviewed her. She said, when they came to my door, and she knocked on, they knocked on the door, and they told me my, my baby had died. She said, you can't take away my baby. I mean, I felt her pain. She said, you can't take away my baby. She broke down and she cried. She said, can't, you can't take away my baby. I can only imagine how she felt. Can't be uh, uh, a good feeling. Just cannot be a good feeling. Here's what Elijah said. Elijah said this. He said, give me the boy. He said, give him to me. So he took him, he took him to his room, the boy's room. And when he got out there, he questioned God himself. And he said, God, why did you allow this to, to happen? But I want you to understand something. 
He took them away from everybody else. Took them away from the mom and, and everybody else. What did I just say to you 15 minutes ago? <laughs> I didn't say that. That's not what I said. Y'all got it wrong. I'm going to move on. Everybody's going to correct me. I'm going to move on. <laughs> so he took him to his room. No, you got it right. He took him to his room. And uh, it makes me wonder now. It took me, it took me when, I, when, I, when I'm there. And I'm asking, quit. I have to think for a moment. Y'all got it just like that. <laughs> That's it. <so. laughs> So, so here's the thing. Uh, uh, he took him that, there because he didn't want anybody to ever feel. That's why he did that. The reason why uh, he told the ladies, the widow, to take, uh, shut the door, turn on his arm, because he didn't want people asking questions. Because when you got people around you don't have light like faith, Amen. they can affect your faith. There's a woman uh, in the book of Acts, uh, ninth chapter, her name is. Uh, tap the Bible says that, that she's the woman who did good works. Good works. Part of what we take our name from in addition to First Thessalonians second chapter, but good works. And uh, uh, they sent for Peter. And Peter came and Peter came and they sent him up to the room where she was. She had died. And uh, she had made garments, she made clothing, and she gave them away. And so people love this lady. We love people like that. And so here she he, he, he goes up there and he gets up there there were a lot of other uh, women, widow women, who were there. They were lamenting. They were crying. They were just, I mean, just bawling. And so he said to them, he said, uh, uh, excuse me, excuse me. I know you're hurting, but I need you to leave. I need you, I need you to come out of the room right now. And the Bible says he knelt down and he, he said, call her name. Tap her, rise. And she rose. He called her by her name because if he didn't call her by her name, somebody else could have rose. It's kind of like when, when Jesus went to the tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. See, it could have been a lot of people on the tomb. He said, Lazarus would come forth. He was specific. I want this Lazarus to come forth. <laughs> Lazarus would come forth. Tabitha, rise. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so the Bible says that she rose and he took her down to the, to the other widow. See, sometimes when people have the same level of faith that we have, we got to stay away from them because they'll talk you out of your faith. I tell people all the time, you heard me say it. Don't let nobody talk you out of your faith. What you believe, what you believe. Use wisdom, but let nobody talk you out of your face. Amen? And so, uh, Tabitha got up and, and uh, walked down steps, and he, he presented her. So when Elijah uh, took uh, the widow's son upstairs, I said again, he had questions, but, but, but he brought him down because the Bible says he laid on three times. When he laid on three times, life came back to, to him, and he, uh, he gave him uh, to his, his mother. There are things that you and I don't understand. There are things that when it comes to miracle, we won't ever understand because we're not God, so we can't comprehend what God comprehends. Amen? So, so the mom said to Elijah, she said, now I know for sure that you are a man of God and that God speaks through you. Amen? Amen. So I want to hear what I want you to understand. That everything that happened prior to the death of this child was connected to Elijah being positioned and the child being positioned. God had a plan. It wasn't something that just was fortuitous. God had a plan all along. God had a plan that, that this, he knew his child was going to die and he had positioned Elijah there for that child to be raised from the dead. So when he sent him to Zarephath, yeah, it was to sustain him, but he had a dual purpose. The other purpose was he's going to raise this young man from the dead. Amen? Amen? And so God knew everything that was going to take place. He knew that the brook was going to dry up. He knew that, that uh, he was going to meet this woman at Zarephath. He knew everything there was to know. And, and God was positioning Elijah and positioning this child. And what God would do is he would put somebody in our path to help us in our time of need. Psalm 103, verse 3 says this. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Amen. He has lots of benefits for us. But if we don't look in the Bible, we don't know what the benefits are. Amen. If you work for a company and they offer you benefits, but if you never read the manual on benefits, you'll never know you got benefits. That's right. I remember once I had read all the benefits and found out that I had access to uh, 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 what they call the, the law group. 
where you got simple things that need to be done, the company paid for. And somebody said to me once, well, why don't you use, you know, the company paid for a uh, law, uh, whatever it is, whatever they call it. So if I, if I want a wheel made, for example, I can just go to them and they pay for it. I don't have to pay $1,000, they pay for it. I didn't know the benefit existed. And so since I didn't know the benefit existed, I didn't use it. How many of us know, don't know the benefits and we're not using them? How many of us don't know that he said one benefit is this? He heals all of our iniquities. He forgive, forgive, I'm sorry, forgive all of our iniquities. He says a benefit is that he forgives all of our iniquities. All of our sins, he forgives them. But second benefit is what we're teaching on. He says, and heals all our diseases. So if we don't know that there's a benefit that God heals us, that's there for us, then we don't use it. We have certain inalienable rights in the Bible, meaning that rights that, that cannot be taken away from us. There are things that are given to us that God has given to us that cannot be taken away from us. They belong to us. Just like us being a U.S. citizen, there are certain rights that we have, inalienable rights that belong to us. And he has given us certain benefits. He has given us these benefits for us to use. We have to understand that God wants us healed and God wants us whole. As I come to a conclusion, I have some points I want you to remember. Point number one is this. God orders your steps for his purpose. It's not always a single focus. He orders your steps for his purpose. Where you're going is not necessarily for you. Where you're going is for God. He's ordering your steps. If you are in the Lord, he's ordering your steps. He's directing you. He's directing me. Amen? What you have in your possession is never too little when it comes to God. Number two, what you have in your position, possession is never too little when it comes to God. He multiplies. Oh, I thank God he's a God that multiplies. I thank God that he can take the little and make it great. Oh, the overwhelming love of God. He does that. Through his overwhelming love. Everything points to his overwhelming love. His plan is for your life and for my life are already recorded. Our future is already planned. All we need to do is walk it out. All we need to do is just walk it out. He provides, number four, he provides for our needs. Through his overwhelming love. If God loves us that much, do you think that he wouldn't want us to eat? He wouldn't want clothes on our backs? I remember years ago, uh, I just got saved and filled with pride. And, and uh, a lady came to my wife and said, I want to buy you the children's school clothes this year. Well, we were in a position where we didn't have the money. You know, you always want to give your kids school clothes. Uh, and so I said to my wife, I said, why'd you tell that lady we were in a situation like that? She said, I didn't tell her anything. She said, God told her. But I held the hall because of my pride, because I thought I should be the one giving and not receiving. God humbled me that day. That lady told my wife, she said, you go buy everything you normally buy for your children. I don't want you to go and just buy what you you buy because I'm paying for it. Whatever you normally do, she said, you buy just like you normally buy. I don't remember what the cost was. I have no idea what it was. But whatever it was, she gave my wife a check for every dime. God provides for our needs. He absolutely provides for our needs. And we got to stop spending time trying to figure out how he's going to do it. He's going to do it. The reason why it doesn't happen is because we worry too much. So we worry so much. He said, I can't do anything because, because you're in the way. You're interfering with what I'm trying to do. Your energy vibes, your waves are coming through me, blocking me. I'm God. God's never offended. Number six, he's, he's never, I'm sorry, number five is trust God and obey him. Trust God and obey him. We may not understand what he's asking us to do, but move anyway. Just get up and move. Number six is this, God is never offended by our questions. He's not going to be upset with us if we ask him, him questions. 
Number seven, obedience and faith moves God to perform miracles. In each case that we saw, the first two cases that we saw, it was through obedience and through faith that miracles were performed. Number eight, God wants us healed and healthy so we can enjoy life. I don't think God wants us walking around in the pain and suffering and not being able to enjoy life because being in pain and suffering also means that we can't enjoy him. Yesterday, I spent hours just listening to praise and worship, just, just listening to songs over and over again because I wanted to just enjoy God. I just wanted to be in his presence. I just wanted to hear songs that lifted my spirit. So two or three hours, I just, just music just over and over and over again because I want to enjoy God. If I'm in pain and sorrow all the time, I can't enjoy God. I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear anything. I just, you know, I'm in pain and sorrow. I just, just want to sleep. <coughs> but I want to be in his presence. Overwhelming love. It's overwhelming love. Point number nine says sometimes we have to shut the door and keep the noise out. If somebody's not saying the same thing you're saying, uh, thinking, you just want to shut the door. Be polite and just stay away and keep believing God for what you believe for. This lady that I knew years ago, uh, we're both riding the bus, Mark, to work. I parked at a Mars station. She, she didn't have Mars, so she took the bus all the way there. But I parked at a Mars station, and uh, I was driving my Ford Escort at the time, and we were catching the bus and going to our job down on, on, on Peachtree Street. She got saved, and this is what she said to me. She said, my father's getting ready to buy me a BMW. My father's getting ready to buy me a BMW. She said, I want quite BMW. My father's going to buy it. She had never told me about her father before. I know, I know him for years. She had never told me about her father. I said, well, I didn't know your father had money like that. She said, I'm talking about my heavenly father. I looked at her like, girl, you don't lost your money. Your heavenly father, you just talking about, you don't lost, you don't gone cuckoo. Your father, your heavenly father, yeah, she got her, you know what, she got her white BMW, and she got a whole lot more, but she also distanced herself from me because I was questioning your father. I mean, I was drilling her like, you know, I've known you all this time, you riding the bus. You don't, even have, you don't have your first car. You talking about a BMW? A BMW? Bavarian Motor Works. You talking about that kind of car? Yeah. My father, she got a car. She got her BMW and a whole lot more. She believed God. She trusted God. And God moved her life. But she had to move people out of her life, too. Number 10 is this. It is our inalienable right to be healed and to be whole. It's our right. God has given us that inevitable right for us to be healed and to be whole. Amen. Amen. So, Father, we thank you that your word is true. We don't look at it as fictionary, but it is plenary, verbally inspired. And so, Lord, we thank you that your words you have life to us. We thank you, Lord God, that it is your overwhelming love that convinces us that you're good and that you want the best for us. So, Father, we thank you and we glorify you. We thank you, Lord God, that if there's any under the sound of my voice, if there's anybody here, Lord God, if there's anybody that's listening through YouTube or Facebook that needs healing, we thank you, Lord God, that healing will take place now through the word that has been heard this morning, the word that's been ministered this morning. And even not, just not today, Lord God, but whenever someone listens to this tape, whether it's a day from now, a week from now, months, or years from now, we thank you, Father, that the anointing of this tape will bring healing to those that listen. We give you glory on and praise for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
our source, you are our healer. So we magnify your name this morning, God. We thank you for our pastor, Pastor Gary Turner, on the word position for God's healing. So Father, we decree and declare that by your stripes we are healed because the word of God says this. Thank you for being Jehovah Jireh. We thank you, Father God, for you led us, you will lead us and guide us into all truth, and your word is all truth. We will be your distribution channel because all things belong to you. Thank you for being a God that multiplies. We will demonstrate faith and will not hold you up. Thank you, Father, for all the benefits you provided for us. Thank you for delivering us from affliction. Thank you, God, for ordering our steps for your purpose. Thank you for multiplying. Thank you for your love. Thank you for providing for our needs. We decree and declare we will obey you, God. We know that you are never offended by our questions when we don't understand the situation we may be in. We will know that obedience and faith is when miracles are performed. We will remember that you want us to enjoy life. So for your word says that you died that we may have life and life more abundantly. We will shut the door to keep the noise out, the noise of unbelief, the noise of doubt and unbelief. Thank you, Father, for the benefits and the right to be healed and whole. So we make a declaration this morning. We decree and declare that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the Lord. Christ has redeemed us from poverty. Christ has redeemed us from sickness. Christ has redeemed us from spiritual death. For poverty, he's given us wealth. For sickness, he's given us health. And for death, he's given us eternal life. And it is true unto us according to the word of God. We delight ourselves in the Lord. And we love him with all our heart. In Jesus' name Jesus. we pray. that the liberal soul shall be made fat. The liberal soul shall be made fat. Amen? And so don't ever say, well, I don't have anything to give. You got something to give. Give what you can give. That baby right there, that baby right there sitting right there, that 17-year-old baby right there sitting right there, she started a job. She pays her tithes. She pays her tithes. Every time she gets paid, she pays her time. My granddaughter comes to church and she gives. 17 year olds. Don't ever say you don't have anything to give. You got something to give. And what she's doing, what they're doing, is that they are preparing for their future. They're laying up in store for their future. They don't even realize what that's what they're doing. They're preparing, they're laying up in store for their future. And that's what God wants. Amen. So don't ever say, I don't have, I don't really have anything to give. Give what you have and let God multiply. Us just would you come, please.
overtaken us with your blessings, oh God. Jesus, as our high priest, we ask that you take these tithes and offerings and carry them before the Father, worship the Father with them, that they may come up before him as a sweet smell. We come in with your word, Deuteronomy 26, verses 1 through 19, Malachi 3, 10 through 12, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 15. Father, we are believe that we have received every need is met. Every wants to feel and every desire is satisfied. In Jesus' name, in church, amen. Amen. Let's all stand for this message. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the Lord God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Your your envelopes, your uh, your your givings are here. Uh, Deaconess Georgia has them, so please see her before you leave the church, so you can see uh, use it for your IRS filings. Amen.